What are you doing here? My office. Not bad, huh? You're supposed to be at the inaugural ball. I was at four inaugural balls. And now I'm here. With you. Where's Melly? A few floors in the whole wing away. Mr. President. I like that. Say it again. Mr. President. <laughs> we can't. We can't.
In that show, and then in 2014, Scandal received Outstanding Drama Series, Kerry Washington received the Outstanding Actress in a Drama Series, and Joe Morton received the Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series from the end of Lacey P. Awards as well. And then lastly, in 2014, Scandal received the Peabody Award for Area of Excellence in Television. So in addition to a lot of the uh, awards that this show has secured uh, in the television realm, it's also a, a pretty much like a, a cult phenomenon now. It, it has a, an extremely huge following. Here are some examples. Um, they are called Scandal Viewing Parties in the Atlanta area, uh, which I found is noteworthy. Uh, Scandal Holics, as they like to refer to themselves, uh, is a Facebook page that's devoted to individuals <laughs> who are admittedly addicted to scandal. And then third, Tamika Washington is a black woman who actually started Scandal Party Idea. So um, if you actually go to her Facebook page, she's like, okay, Scandal is going to be coming up on this Thursday night. Here are some cocktails and here are some appetizers that you could actually have doing your, your Scandal Party wherever it might be, which I found really interesting. Um, however, so now that we're going to kind of shift into um, and looking at you know scandal from a contemporary kind of uh, media perspective to actually looking at it from a social historical context, which is actually the crux of what this presentation is about. Uh, when we look at the social historical significance of the current study today, when we look at black women who Olivia Pope clearly represents in in the television uh, show Scandal, black women are the largest group of single people in the United States. So this is compared with whites, this is compared with Latinos, this is compared with Asians, and with Native Americans. The second thing is this piece will reveal whether the Olivia Pope character is a positive or a negative depiction of black women. So that we're going to actually kind of delve into that second one in more depth. And then finally, the scholarly work will examine a historical and contemporary position of black, of black women and elite white men in America who Pope and Fitz clearly represent in scandal. So um, the research questions for this study are as follows. What black female uh, stereotypes does Olivia Pope exemplify? The second is how does Olivia Pope's illicit relationship with President Fitzgerald Thomas Grant Fitz simultaneously denigrate the position of black females and promote the power and privileged position of European males. And lastly, in what ways is post-traumatic slave syndrome demonstrated by individuals who dismiss the historicity of the uh, Fitzgerald Pope relationship? So the study is also significant because it's actually going to be based on two very, very popular theoretical frameworks. The first is by Collins and looks at the, the various tropes in which black women have been identified in the media. There are, there are six, we'll look at those. And Stevens and Phillips and Zagiri's uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome and Cody Campbell's African uh, self-consciousness and cultural disorientation uh, model. So by looking at Collins' depiction of black women in, in media, so whether that be television or whether that be film, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at post-traumatic slave disorder and a slave syndrome and how that is manifested today in various uh, aspects. And then Camon's uh, uh, self-consciousness and, and cultural mis misrepresentation to essentially argue that the, um, that the Olivia Pope character objectifies black women and in many ways minimizes their own success. And we'll actually kind of look at that in, in a moment. So when we look at the history of uh, Africans when they actually came to the United States, millions of them died in transit from Africa to the United States. I'm sure everyone uh, in the room knows that. But even when black women came to America, right, so, so to even to, to make the journey was a very tumultuous one. Many, unfortunately, did not make the journey. But even when they actually stepped foot on American soil, a lot of their difficulties, right, it's, it's a lot of they, they became traumatized in a, in a different way. Um, the physical and psychological safety of black women was threatened when they arrived in America. Uh, Anderson wrote, if you were caught in one of these raids, there were thousands of raids every year, 
all over Africa, particularly West Africa. And if you were a woman, you would most likely be sexually abused. Rape, public and private, gain an individual was a primary form of dis disempowering a powerful and proud people. It was usually the first act after all were rounded up and shackled and yoked. So think about the, the amount of trauma that this causes clearly to the woman whose body has been violated. But also, kind of also keep in mind the effect that this has on, have on the men, right? The husbands, the sons, right? The fathers of these women because they were rendered powerless, right? And watching these very uh, hostile and atrocious acts be committed on the women in their families. <coughs> So we're kind of I'm going to briefly go through our, our review of literature, misogynation in the United States. Uh, the first case was in 1630, which is actually 10 years after the first uh, Africans arrived in the United States. The Cold War uh, actually explicitly prohibited marital and non-marital sexual relationships between Africans, whether slave or free, and Europeans. However, we, we all know, especially all of you as, as future lawyers, you know that just, just because something is on the books and in law doesn't mean that people abide by the law. It doesn't mean that the law is enforced. And the Cold War was an example of that. White men still had relationships with black women, right? Even, even though it was against the law for them to do so. And then Occupant and Quadru involves were ways in which, especially many uh, many women who were of mixed ethnic uh, racial identity of, of black uh, and, and white, they, they typically tried to kind of elevate their social status. So many of the mothers of these daughters would give them death in their, their greatest finery and actually have balls, in which typically uh, planters, uh, those with, with means would actually attend these balls and actually um, uh, uh, allow these women to become um, the mistress of a married man, right? So it shows that even historical, what we were, what we see in scandal has actually had um, um, has actually been in progress for many years now. Okay. Then also, Blake de defines in, in 2011 white supremacy as an historically based, institutionally perpetuated system of exploitation and oppression of continents, nations, and peoples, classified as non-white <coughs> by continents, nations, and peoples who by virtue of their white, light skin pigmentation and or ancestral um, origin from Europe classified themselves as white. So white supremacy is the notion that the values, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors of white people are superior to those of non-white people. And we operate, especially in, in this part of the world, we operate greatly under white supremacy. A lot of studies have found that, so for example, in education settings, right, in um, intellectual spaces, whether it be in elementary school, through every form of education, right, um, black history is either not taught or minimized. That is an example of white supremacy. Um, other examples, if you just look at, uh, t you know, typically on any type of fashion magazine, you are going to overwhelmingly see white women on, those, on the cover of those pages. Open the magazine, you will still see white women overwhelmingly on the cover of those pages, right? Um,